So we've done a lot of amazing things. We've done things like map human DNA. We've walked on the moon, we've floated in space, we've mapped and been to the depths of the oceans. We've mapped gravitational waves in space. And we've made breathtakingly beautiful artworks of all different kinds. But the thing we do all this with, the tool we use and rely on to do this, the human mind, remains one of the last great remaining scientific mysteries. We really don't understand the human mind. We don't understand human consciousness. And largely, it's because we simply don't have the tools to measure the mind. And people often ask me, well, why can't we just ask people about the mind? Why can't we just say, you know, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you intuitive? Are you creative? So who's ever used online dating? Any hands? No, one's too shy. <laughs> so if you have, maybe you've seen words like this, super hot, thin and fit, stud. And it turns out, as you probably would have guessed, that people on online dating sites exaggerate just a little bit. And sometimes they straight up lie. And there's lots of data on this. For example, men using online dating sites are on average much taller than men in the general population. <laughs> and this is not just with online dating. You see exaggeration on Facebook, on Twitter, on lots of online platforms. And people aren't being deceptive intentionally all the time. What they're doing is managing their, uh, their impression to other people. But this is not just an issue with online platforms. If I was going to talk to you and ask you questions about yourself, are you happy, are you sad, are you anxious, are you depressed, are you creative, just verbally, what you tell me as well wouldn't necessarily be the truth. It might not be, or it wouldn't necessarily be accurate. All kinds of things can change that interaction. The context, like this, if I went and talked to one of you now, you probably will feel comfortable telling me your details. This extends to questionnaires as well. If I gave you a questionnaire with little boxes you need to tick, again, the data from that wouldn't necessarily be that accurate. And this is a huge problem for psychology, for medicine, for neuroscience, and for other fields. How can we accurately get information from people about their mind? So depression, mental health, is a huge deal. People are suffering. And it's costing us more and more globally uh, to deal with this. Estimations are predicted by 2030 to be up around 6 trillion per year cost of mental health. So here's one way to think about this. We have the, the brain, we have the physical body and the physical brain. And we have tremendous things, fantastic tools to measure the brain. I can put you in an fMRI machine and scan your brain, see which areas are active. I can zoom in and look at individual neurons with a microscope, I can look at things happening between neurons, how they're communicating, all kinds of other great techniques. But the other side here, the mind, we don't have the tools to measure that. We don't have, if you like, uh, uh, a microscope to measure the mind. We don't have that kind of tool. So what I want to ask you guys, what if it was possible to build such a tool, to build technologies we could sort of tap in and directly measure the mind and step around directly asking people verbally or with a written uh, form about themselves. And the next thing I'm going to introduce, an idea that illusions <coughs> might be the microscope for the mind. <coughs> what do I mean by illusions? There are all kinds of illusions. There are optic, there are visual, there are tactile, there are auditory, many different types. Here's one example. So, this should work. If I get you guys just to, to look at that blinking green dot there in the center, and just keep your eyes focused on that, and look at that. And just without moving your eyes, pay attention to those three yellow dots. Just see if anything unusual is happening. Anyone see anything happen? Yeah? So, what you may be experiencing is some of the yellow dots disappearing. Now look at the yellow dot, you'll see that they're there the whole time. They're never disappearing off the screen there. In other words, the light bouncing off your screen, hitting your eyes, is continuous. But somewhere in your brain, your awareness of that yellow is disappearing. 
So your consciousness is changing. So this is, this is, this is a great uh, visual illusion. It's called motion-induced blindness. This, this moving pattern here uh, is, is inducing this blindness of these bright yellow dots. So this idea that illusions like that could be a microscope for the mind. So rather than me asking you how you are or if you're uh, 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 creative or <coughs> intuitive or all kinds of questions like that, maybe how those yellow dots disappeared or if they didn't disappear might tell me something about your mind. So could we hack these illusions? Could we take out the yellow dots and put something else there in its place? Or maybe we could combine multiple illusions, right? We could add, say, three different illusions together and together like components, they can form a test for the mind to measure some dimension of your mind. So human intuition, it's a word that we are fairly familiar with. People use this word often in daily language. There are lots of books and hundreds of papers about intuition. People often describe it as a gut response to something. So maybe you're at dinner last night uh, and you ordered a seafood dish and when it arrived, something just didn't seem right. Maybe the smell, the colour, the texture, maybe the decor in the restaurant, all these subtle cues somehow you picked up on and you had a funny feeling. Maybe you didn't eat it and everything was good. Maybe you went ahead and ate it and you got food poisoning. So that's one way people describe intuition. Using emotional, semi-conscious information to help them in their lives, to help their decisions. So we started studying intuition a few years ago in my lab. Uh, and where we started from, how we, we wanted to develop a way to measure intuition so scientifically, objectively, and reliably in the lab, rather than me asking you uh, verbally. So we started with first principles thinking. So what is that? So Elon Musk uh, for SpaceX talks about first principles thinking uh, when designing and building rockets. And the simple idea is you want to go right back to the beginning, the basic ingredients of that thing. So in terms of rockets, that might be the metal, the, you know, the steel, the glass, the plastic, everything that might go in there and then move forward to build the rocket. So going back to the, the basic ingredients. So we can do the same thing with intuition. So what are the basic ingredients of intuition? So emotions, we talk about gut response, a feeling of something. Emotions might be the basic ingredient. Uh, sometimes they're unconscious. Sometimes it's conscious, sometimes we're not really aware of it. It's something that's you know, a very vague feeling. And it's typically rapid. People talk about a gut response being a fast thing. It's not something we have to carefully think about over and over. And these elements have a positive effect on our decision making. They help us make better decisions. So if we take these basic ingredients, can we build a tool in the lab to measure intuition? Intuition. So are there illusions that we can, we can find that might measure these things? And yes, there is. So you've seen the film Inception, the whole idea in that film is to incept an idea into someone's mind, to get it in there without them having any idea. So we need a way to do what we call emotional inception, to get an emotion into someone's mind without them knowing we've done that. And it's a great illusion we can use to do that. It's called binocular rivalry. We study this a lot in the lab. Let me just explain it a little bit. The way it works, we have two different color patterns, the red one and the green one. And we can set it up with mirrors and things in the lab so that one eye sees the red and the other eye sees the green. And we set that up so that they're both, we see them in the same place at the same time, which can't actually happen in the real world, two different objects. So rather than you seeing 3D like you are now, what happens is that the brain uh, uh, can't fuse those two patterns together and your conscious awareness vacillates and oscillates back and forth. So you see the green pattern, you see the red pattern, the green, but back and forth, back and forth. So you can kind of do a demo of this. If you just get your hand and put it in front of one of your eyes, a little bit out here, go ahead and do this. Um, you kind of get a version of binocular ivory. But because you're in the dark there, your hand's going to be quite dark, so I'm going to be much, much stronger, so you're going to be seeing me and not the hand. If you put a little light on your hand and you equalize the brightness of those two images, then you start seeing these oscillations, these vacillations. <coughs> but the cool thing for, for our emotional inception here is that when you're seeing the red pattern, 
You don't see the green path. It's gone. It's, there's no awareness of it. So if you want to incept emotion into someone's mind, all you have to do is take that green pattern and swap it out with an emotional stimulus. So maybe it's a, a shark attack, a dog attack, a snake bite, or a spider, <coughs> something emotive and, and nasty like that. So we can show the person this nasty image during this binocular ivory thing, and they'll never see it. All they'll see is the other red pattern. So that's how we do emotional inception. So we can sneak emotion in there, get it into the brain and the mind. It's being processed. We can see physiological responses. Then what we do is combine that with some form of decision making. We have different ways of measuring decision making in the lab. So together, that builds a tool to measure intuition. And we've done that. And we've shown that these unconscious emotions can boost the decision accuracy. You can make better decisions when you can use this extra emotional, unconscious information. It can also speed up your reactions, make you faster at making these accurate decisions, and even make you more confident. So you make these fast, accurate decisions and you feel more confident about them. So you could think of this as a microscope for intuition, like I was talking about before, a microscope for the mind, a microscope for intuition. So we've done that with intuition. We've done that for the imagination, human imagination, mental imagery. If I imagine an apple in my mind, I see an apple. Not everyone has mental imagery like that, but we've hacked, uh, in fact, the same illusion, binocular rivalry, and developed a way to measure mental imagery reliably, scientifically in the lab, without having to give people questionnaires or talk to them verbally, without having to get their opinion about it. We're also now doing this with hallucinations. We're developing ways to measure hallucinations in the lab, again, reliably, objectively, and scientifically. So those last two things there, we can use to help reduce suffering. We can use the tools to measure the imagination to understand imagery when it goes wrong in disorders of anxiety, like PTSD, when people have imagery they just can't control. So we can measure that and figure out how to modulate it. And hallucinations are uh, another way to reduce suffering. When it comes to intuition, we can use tasks like that to help boost performance. How can we do that? Or well, we can train people to be more intuitive. And this is a big deal in all kinds of areas, the military, in sports, how to train them to use that unconscious emotional information. So as I said at the beginning, uh, we've done some amazing things. We've mapped the double helix of DNA. We've uh, walked on the moon and floated in space soon to go up to Mars, apparently. Um, we've been to the depths of the oceans, uh, maps gravitational waves, and doing all kinds of cool things with string theory, relativity. And we've made beautiful, breathtaking works of art, from novels to artworks to films and music. But the next big thing, the next thing we need to do is the human mind. We need to figure out ways to measure the human mind, map it, figure out how it works. Some people say, we can't do this, there's an inherent problem. The human mind cannot understand itself. In other words, the mind cannot understand the mind. It can't be done. But I think that's too pessimistic. I think we can do that, can be done. And I hope I've given you guys a little bit of a flavor of how we can go about that, hacking these illusions, hacking psychology to measure the mind.